What do you think about the sign? Um, some, I, what I think about it, it's a fact that Jesus died for our sins okay. and we should stop sinning. That's right. He's going to fall away. You don't want that to happen, do you? <laughs> no, you don't want to fall away and go to hell in the end, right? All right. So, I mean, it's, it's important for you to get this right, man, that you can, you can know what to do going forward and you can stay in the faith, you know, and be holy. Amen? Yes, sir. Amen. Okay. What's your name? Uh, Donovan Troy. Donovan Troy. Yes, sir. Can I pray for you, Donovan? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I just pray for Donovan right now, Father. My brother didn't believe him when I said there was going to be people big signs, so I needed a picture to show him. What do you think about the sign, though? Do you agree with it? You took a picture of it. Mm. I think it fails to take into account what the Bible actually said. That's what the sign says, what the Bible says. If you don't think the Bible said it, you need to read your Bible again. The Bible definitely says this. Hey, man, what's going on? How's your semester been? What was that? How's your semester been so far? Oh, horrible. Horrible? Sorry to hear that, man. Good to see you. I'm doing it now. What you up to? Doing this? Doing the work of the Lord. Yeah? yeah. Having fun out here? Yeah, I guess so. Got a lot of conversations yet? No, not today. Not yet. It seems like this campus has, I started coming here at the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. And that fall semester and all of 2019 was really busy. It seems like since then, since the pandemic, it seems like everything slowed down. Yeah, more people just do online stuff and stay inside more. Is that what it is? Yeah, and they've got their specific routes, library, dorm, library, dorm, class. Okay, class. so the library is where they're doing their classes. Yeah, you do all your work in there on the computers. Yeah. And just go back to your room. Wow. So how many classes do you go to in person? I go to all my, I hate all my classes. Okay. I like them. Yeah. They're horrible. I did one once. Good thing is you can cheat, but okay. you're not going to learn anything. 
like so. Oh, can, online, okay. Yeah. Plus, I like I, I like better face-to-face -face instruction. I just yeah. think that's better. Yeah. And looking at a screen all day. So how many how many people do you think are in each class right now? Like Twenty-five. And how many are enrolled in each class? Probably. What do you mean by that? Like people who are taking it online instead. Oh, online they still do about the same, like twenty-five. So the teacher by half. has like the same amount of work to grade. So about half and a half, huh? Yeah. Half online, half in person. Yeah. Interesting. This where you stay, the Oaks? No, no, I'm uh, over at uh, Center Point. Okay. Over there. Cool. So I got my own room. I go there, game room, library, all the way over here because I want hibachi. Oh, hibachi's in there, okay. Yeah, and steak in there. Cool. Uh, Who doesn't like steak? Who doesn't like steak? Vegetarians. <laughs> Vegans. <laughs> well, you know, I had an argument for veganism come up. Yeah? What's that? Oh, it was... Okay. Probably heard it before. Um, yeah. No, it uses the new language models the AI uses. Okay. Uh, so AI is now, where it's at the point where like, let's say I didn't speak any English. Right. And I walked up to you, and I start perfectly speaking English with you. Yeah. And you walk away from here going, wow, that was such a meaningful conversation. And I walk away going, I don't know what I just said, but he sounded like happy, so it must have been good. <laughs> That's what we can do with animals at this point. Oh. With depicting what whales say, oh, okay. what dolphins say. Okay. So we're almost on the brink of understanding dolphins. So what, what I say is, if animals have the ability to have intelligent conversation, yeah. then we need to reconsider what we count as a moral agent. And what, need, what new roles do we define for these moral agents? Well, they're not moral agents. Why not? They're not made in God's image. Does God's image define what a moral agent is? That's right. Where does he define that? Uh, in the scripture. In the scripture? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he made man in his image and make animals in his image. Animals can be smart. I mean, there's some animals, like you, you mentioned, dolphins are probably one of the smartest animals yeah. in the whole world. Not many people eat dolphins, though. I know. Or whales. Yeah. But are there any animals we eat that could pass the self-awareness test? Uh, maybe dogs. But maybe people eat yeah. dogs either. Maybe, yeah. in Asia, maybe in Asia they eat dogs a little bit. But they've started to ban that a bit. Yeah. Horses. People eat some people eat horses. You still don't think a dog could be a moral agent? No. Dogs can't be a moral agent. Even if we could have a conversation with it? No. I mean, conversation can be very limited. It'd be like a hundred times worse than speaking to someone in a different language. You don't even know the language. What about to a whale? What about to a whale? So, whales have been around for millions of years. Nah. Yeah. No one's been around more than 6,000 years. Okay, well, under that, so whales have been here for 6,000 years. Yeah, that's true. And of whales, they have their own language. The dolphins have their own language. And there's uh -huh. this thing called a superpod that comes together to hunt together yeah. at the same time. And they speak a third language whenever they're together hunting during this certain season. Yeah. So they have probably a very rich culture. At least that's my assumption. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. So if they do really have some knowledge and we could talk to them, like there I, I personally think there should be efforts and protections against any hunting of these animals or any misuse of them. They should be seen as moral agents. Okay, so I mean if you're gonna come from the perspective of evolution, mm -hmm. um, then you you probably might have something there. You might have something there, but the scripture says, like after the flood, before the flood, everybody was a vegetarian, yeah. according to the Bible. After the flood, God said to Noah and his family, now I'll give you the animals. I gave you the, the herbs and the vegetables before, and now I give you all things. So we can eat whale if we want to. I have no interest in eating whale. I don't think they would, would taste very good, to be honest. I know they were hunted in the past for soap. Yeah. Japan really had like a hunting yeah. ritual. They had a whole yeah. argument on, we can still hunt them, They're like, all right, one a year, but you have to do it for a ceremony. Yeah, I mean, in the past, they were hunted a lot. Yeah, for like I Almost think for soap, extinction. for fat, right? Yep. Mostly, and like you know, different elephants are hunted for tusk, mm -hmm. uh, for practical things. But there's other ways we can figure out so those animals don't go extinct to to make soap and all that stuff. To so we don't have to keep on hunting. I, I understand the practicality of that, and just want to have the animals around, not making the animal extinct. Extinct, you know. But as far as like eating, like I, how many people eat whales or dolphins or other creatures that are really intelligent? The most intelligent ones we know of, none yeah. of them, they're not really get eaten very much. I know, but I, I, I still want to make the point that people shouldn't do it. It's not, I, and it's very insignificant now, but I think it could be with future research, it could be something. I don't really have a problem with that. 
But the problem I have is the hypocrisy. Like people say, we shouldn't eat these, but we should kill babies that are unborn. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point too. Is we should kill babies from there. It's like, where do you draw the line on what counts? Well, I mean, babies count I way more. Think, I don't. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that babies should be killed. Yeah. But I think everything is equal to one. I don't think you can put a value. Like you can't say five dollars equal a human. Yeah. You can't put a value on a human at all, really. Everything's one. Everything's equal to one. You can't put a value on a human at all, really. Yeah. I mean, and you never know what that human's going to become, either. Mm-hmm. You um, really don't. And it, the value of the human, because of its size and its location and its underdevelopment, does not take away its value. You know? I had another question. Yeah. So ahead. with your members, do you have, do you have a group? That you have a church, yeah. you have a church? Yeah. What do you think the rate of people remaining people remaining with the adopted um, values that you guys hold? Uh, so as far as like remaining a Christian? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh I've seen people depart from the faith for sure. Mm-hmm. But would you say I'd say it's probably 75%, 80%. That stay. remain? That stay, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's really good. Yeah, I'd say maybe 20, 25 leave. We were talking about that because I had a professor, we were talking about cults. Yeah. And how religion probably started as cults. Okay. That was his idea that religion yeah. started as cults, and that's why more, um, he said in his words, right wing church groups last longer because they're more strict within um, giving out their values, and they're more strict in making sure that the people aligned within their group are sticking to the word that is spoken within their group. I think for, for us, um, Number one, that, that's faulty reason to say we came from cults. And I don't, I don't use cult in a negative stigma. I yeah. think a lot of things are cults. Like people smoking cigarettes is a cult. There's a whole group of information yeah. there, and you're supporting yeah. an ideology. I think it's kind of a misuse of the word. I mean, cult usually has a negative connotation to it. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think it should. I don't. There's nowhere in the definition that says a cult's a negative thing. I mean, if you look at the definition, like a t- typical dictionary, it's probably going to say something negative. Okay. Yeah, and and as far as in Christianity, like we would consider cults like Mormonism, mm-hmm. Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, those are offshoots of Christianity that are, have heresy or false teaching in them mm-hmm. that we would say that they're not, they're not our brothers in Christ. There's other people within the Christ, Christianity, like even like Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Presbyterians, that I would consider brothers in Christ as long as they're obeying God, and then I'll go off into like the, some of the more heretical things like Mormonism teaching that Jesus Christ is a spirit baby of Elohim, and he's the spirit brother of the devil. And Elohim was a human on another planet at one point in time. He got exalted to godhood. That's Just so completely, completely crazy stuff. Yeah. So that, that's what we would consider a cult. But as far as like the people in our church, I mean, we don't like have some kind of like thumb on their head, right? We don't like, we're not like micromanaging them, yeah. right? So they, we have church once a week. And the, the brothers, the, the men in the fellowship are really close. We talk to each other all throughout the week, uh, keep each other accountable. Mm-hmm. Um, the women, same thing. You know, and then the women ha- who are married have husbands that are helping them, and the children who are in a fellowship have fathers and mothers who are helping them stay in the truth. But no one forces them. Yeah. Like my, I, I have a son who's 18 who has nothing to do with Jesus. He's out of my house. He doesn't want anything to do even with me. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't, I can't force myself upon him. Yeah. You know, but so. You can't, and, but you also can't call him a member. No, no, he's definitely not. Yeah. So but he wouldn't call himself that. So that's what I'm saying. It's not even... It's not. He even, knows better. Yeah. So when I say that to you, I was I don't mean it in a negative way. Yeah, I'm I understand. Almost in a, like, I know you're not trying to really, offend. I'm not yeah, offended. No that's, a, no, that's a really good thing that you guys are like that. Yeah. You have free will. ability within each other. There's free will. I mean, there's free will. Everyone has free will. There's also accountability. I read the comments on the video. <laughs> and everyone's like, what do you mean there's no knowledge? I don't even know what I was saying at this point. That was so long ago. Yeah. But yeah, I, I still... There is free will. I'm not... I'm yeah. doing that one again. Amen. I'm glad you, glad you come to that. Yeah. Now the truth on that. That's good. I can't prove it, but it's probably there. Well, I don't see how it couldn't be. Wouldn't make us anything if there wasn't free will. That's but well, yeah. I gotta get some food. Okay, man. It's good Take to care, see man. you, man. Good talking to you, Gavin. I hope you guys get some more conversation. In yeah. This doesn't look very promising. Talkative. Yeah. Hey, we're over by UCC. It's kind of dead over there, too. Honestly. Starbucks. Can you go over? Uh, did they let you go over there? Is that near by, by the bookstore? Uh, TLC. Which way is that? Just that way? Yeah, just go. Um, oh, it, it's just just down from you at UCC, right? Yeah, like where the campus by, by the library. Is, yeah, yeah. The library is yeah, yeah. right there. Okay, yeah. 
I think that's where all the people are going to be crossing. I think that's an active spot. Okay. So I try that. Okay. Appreciate it, again. Yeah, nice to see you all again. Yeah. Take care, man. What was your name again? Ty. Ty? Yeah. Nice to see you. All right, Gavin. Take it easy. Take care, man. Have a good semester if I'll see you again. Oh, well, you're not having a semester. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, man? Oh. What do you think about the sign? Hmm? What do you think about the sign? Um, some, I, what I think about it, it's a fact that Jesus died for our sins okay. and we should stop sinning. That's right. Amen. So you're a follower of Christ? Yeah. Okay. How long have you been following him for? Hmm? How long have you been following him? Since I was born. Since you were born? Oh. I've always been a Christian. Always? Hmm? Well, the Bible says, and Jesus Christ says in John 3, you must be born again. So right. being the, the first birth is not enough. Mm-hmm. So you, you were born the first time. You are born to your mother and your father. You are born to their, their family. You have your father's last name still, I'm assuming. That way, you had no choice in that, right? Yeah. But on becoming a part of the family of God, you have a choice. Mm -hmm. And God calls you by your own free will that he's given you to repent of your sins, put your faith in Jesus. And if you do those things with genuineness and sincerity of heart, he will see that and he will give you the Holy Spirit. Right. And the Holy Spirit will cause you to be changed and become alive on the inside. Mm -hmm. So you become a different person. Well, I became born again when I was 19. Hmm? I became born again when I was 19. Nice. Were you born as a Christian? Uh, well, no one's born as a Christian. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't raised in a Christian family, if that's what you mean. No one, no one can be born a Christian. You have to be born again to become a Christian. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so being born into a Christian family, going to church all your life, or having parents who are Christians does not make you a Christian. You must decide for yourself to become one. Right, and I am one. When did you become one? I can't really say. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to be able to tell me the exact time. Right. You probably don't remember your first birth either. My first birth? No. <laughs> I mean, so that's not the most important thing that you remember the exact date and time, but that you're actually loving Jesus and following him. It's the most important thing. Yeah. But you, you, you say you're doing that? You're following Jesus Christ? You're mm -hmm. obeying him? Yeah, that, and I see your cap that says fear God. Yeah. So that means don't do anything that will commit sin. That's right. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is a man's all. Mm -hmm. Man. You from here, around here originally? From Carrollton? No, yeah. Gwinnett. Gwinnett, okay. Cool. Just going to school here, huh? Yeah, just coming here from college. Okay. Great. Thanks. Good, good talk to you, man. God bless you. Being a Muslim, a bad thing. Well, they're not following Jesus Christ. Hmm? They're not following Jesus Christ. Yeah, but they have their own beliefs. That doesn't make it right. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? No man comes to the Father but by me. Right. So how could they be right with God if they're not coming to him through Jesus? I mean, Hindus have their own beliefs too. Yeah, same as Muslims. They believe only in one God. Well, Hindus don't believe in one God. They believe in millions of gods, but... But that's beside the point. Just because they have their own beliefs, I mean, their beliefs are right. What matters is what is true. Jesus said, I am the truth. Right. And so they don't have Jesus Christ, so they don't have the truth. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, they've sinned against God, haven't they? Yeah. We but all they have. have. They, have sins that, they have sins in their own religion that they can't do. Well, I mean, what because matters is not what your religion says. It matters what is true. Right? So if what, they, what their religion says is wrong... It doesn't matter if they're obeying the religion or not because it's wrong. It's not true. But the Bible says it's true. And because the Bible is truth, if you're not obeying the Bible, therefore you're not obeying the truth. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if Jesus is the only way to the Father and they're not coming to the Father through Jesus, then they couldn't possibly be saved from their sins. So that's why. So you're saying it's best to be a Christian? It's the only way. Not just best, it is the best. It's just the only way too. So Jesus said, I am the way. So when, when someone says, I am the something, it's excluding everything else. Right. So Allah cannot be the way. Because Jesus is the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Muslims are deceived. 
It's a false religion. Every religion is false, except for the religion of Jesus Christ is the Lord of. So you're saying even Christianity is false? No, Jesus is the Lord of Christianity. Yeah, I mean, there's some forms that call themselves Christian that are wrong. You've probably heard of Mormons before. Mormon, yeah, Mormons teach that that God is, was, was a human and got exalted to Godhood. And then Jesus Christ is the spirit child of Elohim, their God, and that the devil is a brother of Jesus. That's what Mormonism teaches. Um, is that a form of Christianity? They call themselves Christian, but it's not Christianity. No, that's probably like a false religion. It's a false religion. It's a, it's, we would call it a cult. And so Jesus is against that view, that form of Christianity. He's against that form of Christianity. So not everyone who calls himself a Christian really is a Christian. Right. Only those who truly follow Jesus in obedience and holiness. Okay, like if you're, if you're the type that doesn't like going to church and don't read your Bible, you can be like a false Christian. That's right, that's a false Christian. Yeah, because Christians love fellowshipping with other believers and Christians love reading the Bible because it's God's word. And above that, they want to believe the Bible and obey the Bible. Right. Because you can read the Bible all day, but if you don't obe believe and obey, you're still in trouble. Right. Even, even Muslims, they have their own rules to obey too. Yeah. But the rules are wrong. So are you saying, let's say they don't report, it's forbidden for them to report. It's not, not going to help them. It's not going to help them to abstain from eating pork when the Bible doesn't say you can't eat pork. The Old Testament says that, but the New Testament does not say that. Yeah. So we're, as, as a follower of Christ, I'm allowed to eat pork mm -hmm. or shrimp or lobster. I'm allowed to wear mixed fabrics. I'm allowed to trim my beard if I want to. And I'm allowed to do those things because the Bible gives me permission to do those things. So if someone's like, oh, I'm not going to eat pork, I'm going to be a vegan because my religion says to be a vegan, not eat meat at all. It's not going to help them get right with God. And I think it has something to do with the pig being a dirty animal. Well, they say that, I mean, but I, I've known people who have raised pigs, and pigs are probably cleaner than chickens. Chickens will, will poop anywhere, and they'll eat food off of poop. Pigs, if you put them in a, in a pen, they'll poop in one corner and keep all their... But they like to jump in the mud a lot. Mud's, I mean, mud's fine. Mud doesn't kill anybody, but yeah. poop is, is nasty. Poop Even is dirty. Even Jews don't eat pork either. I know, that's because the, the Torah says not to eat pork. Hmm? God told them in the Old Testament to eat pork. That's fine. But New Testament, God does not say that. Yeah. So we're under the, as a Christian, I'm under the New Covenant, not the Old Covenant of God's law, the Torah that he gave to the Jewish nation, the Israelites. So I don't have, if someone wants to refrain, refrain from eating pork, I have no problem with that. Yeah. But it's not going to help them be right with God. But if they eat pork in their, if Muslims eat pork in their religion, they're committing sin. Yep. But, it's, but their religion is wrong. It doesn't really matter what their religion says. What matters is what God says. The true religion of the Bible so it really matters in the end. Not what the Quran or Islam says, not what Hinduism says, not even what Judaism says. Because I think we Christians, Muslims, and Jews believe in the same God. No, not true. That's not true. The Quran says that Allah has no son. Does God have a son? He does in our belief as Christians. I'm, I'm asking about what our belief is. I know what our belief is. I'm asking, what is the truth? See, both those statements can't be true. It can't be true that Allah has no God, that God has no son, right? And that God does have a son at the same time. That can't both be true. So one's false and one's true. So Islam is false. The Bible is true. God has a son. And he, one of the ways he shows his love for the world is by sending his son to suffer and die for us. Right. That through that we can have forgiveness of sins and the mercy of God. But when Islam says something the opposite of what the Bible says, I reject Islam as a false religion and cling to the scriptures. Because the scriptures is God's truth. It's God's word. And the Quran is false. Right? When it disagrees with the, with the scriptures. So it doesn't matter what their religion says necessarily, it matters what the truth is. And if what if what their religion says is true, I have no problem with it. If what their religion says is not true, then I have a problem with it. Because the Bible is true. So name the religions that you're against. Anything except for biblical Christianity. Anything except for biblical Christianity. I'm against it in this way because it's leading people. against the Jews too? Well, I mean, I've, I've preached the Jews. There are Jews who are followers of Jesus too. 
but it's few and far between. Like I've been to Israel three times to preach to them, and there are Jews there who are following Jesus. Right. But it's few and it's like probably two or three percent of total. But yeah, so yeah, Jews are wrong. If they're still following, uh, and and really the ones who don't follow Jesus, very few of them follow the Old Testament. We Christians don't follow the Old Testament. No, we don't, but I'm saying Jews, they don't even follow their book. Like, they only believe in the Old Testament, right? The ones that don't follow Jesus only believe in the Old Testament, not the New Testament. They don't even follow that. They're not even obeying that. Which one, the Old Testament? Yeah. But they're, they're, but they're supposed to follow the rules of the Old Testament. They don't. That's my point. They're not even doing that. So they, they don't even obey their own religion. Like in the Old Testament, it says to get forgiveness of sins, you must have a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, in the temple. They don't even have a temple right now. And so they're not, they're not even able to offer animal sacrifices to receive forgiveness of sins from God. Of course, when Jesus died on the cross, he did away with all that stuff, mm -hmm. the temple sacrifices, but the Jews can't even obey their own religion. So they have problems with that. So yes, Biblical Christianity is the only truth. Everything else is false. Yeah, and I see that's why they're always um, advertising things about Christianity. Who's doing that? No, like in this school, I've seen a lot of things like this. Like, you know how people come and start advertising about Christianity? Like this thing you're doing yeah. right now? Yeah, I, I come here like three or four times a semester. Yeah, I've seen it a lot. But this, but the this, the campus isn't sponsoring me. They don't agree with me. Huh? The campus is not doing this. I'm doing this on my own accord. Right. So if if we were up to the campus, I think the campus probably wouldn't want me here. Like the leadership have meetings. i try to find a way to get me to leave. But because we're in America, they can't do that. See, freedom of speech and freedom of religion in America, so they can't do that. So yeah, so you can be any religion in America. That's right. That's right. So if, if a Muslim wanted to come here and do what I'm doing, he could do that. So they can preach their own thing about what the Quran says. That's right. But how often do you see that? I've never seen one yet. See? So I mean, true love, <coughs> true love, if we have the truth, true love compels me to say something. I mean, if I claim to have eternal life as a follower of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. I claim to have escaped hell and escaped my sins, and I'm going to God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. I claim all that, but I do nothing to share it with others. That's pretty unloving, right? And Muslims make the same kind of claim. They say that they're the only ones who have eternal life. Allah will be, have merciful, be merciful on them. He will not be merciful towards me because I'm a Christian, right? I'm a, I'm a false, I'm false according to them. But if they, if they really have the truth, wouldn't the loving thing to do would be to go out and tell people about it? Through the Muslims? Yeah. If they had the truth, wouldn't it be loving to say something about it? To yeah. share it with others? Mm -hmm. and that's what Jesus tells us to do as Christians, to share the truth with others. But I guess to them, they only share about Allah because that's the only belief. No, I understand that, but they don't even do that. That's not my point is. If they really believe that's true, it should compel them to share. Why aren't Muslims here sharing about the Quran? Okay, maybe there are a few Muslims here. Well, there's, there's actually, I ran into quite a few Muslims here, but it doesn't matter how few there are. The fact is, if, if Islam is true, they should be willing to share it out of love for others, right? That makes sense to me. Like if I was standing by a, by a uh, where there was a bridge, right? There's a bridge out, the bridge was destroyed. And I was a half mile before that bridge. And I was telling people, stop, stop, you're, the bridge is out, you're gonna die. That's love. But if I knew about the bridge being out and did nothing about it, that That's wouldn't be love. love. That's right. So this is, love compels me to share. Right. And if they truly think they have the truth, Muslims and the Quran, it should compel them to share. That's what love does. Right. But you rarely ever see Muslim evangelists anywhere. I and mean, I've been preaching on college campuses for almost two decades now, almost 20 years, 135 college campuses. And I've, I don't think I've ever seen a Muslim evangelist once. Maybe they're scared to, maybe they're scared to express their freedom of religion. Maybe, I mean, but whatever it is. They may, they may have a feeling that may get discriminated because of them being Muslim. I don't think so. I don't think that would happen. But I mean, it, even if that were to happen, like shouldn't love cause you to overcome that fear? 
Yeah. Your love for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think really deep down inside, they know their religion is false. It's not true. It's not the only way. So. But I mean, I've talked, I've, I've been persecuted for being a Christian. I've been persecuted for preaching the gospel and even in Israel. And I was there with my friend last year in May. And uh, a month, he was preaching the gospel, he had a little mic. And they came behind him and took his scissors and cut his cord while he was preaching. Destroyed his mic. Was it because he was a Christian? Yeah. Uh, yeah because they're doing it in like a Jewish majority country. Well, it was the Muslims did it. Muslim. But Israel is a Jewish country. Yeah, it is. But still, they need to hear the truth. I'm just telling you that just because there might be some difficulty because you're preaching the truth, does not mean you shouldn't do it. You should still share the truth. Yeah. So. I didn't, well, I didn't know there. I wonder how many Muslims are in Israel. In Israel? Mm -hmm. Quite a few. Just a few. No, I said quite a few. Now there's, the percentage of, I think it's probably the second biggest religion in Israel. Really not Christianity? No, 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 definitely not Christianity. That's the minority, very small percentage, maybe like three or four percent are Christians maybe. But Muslims, yeah, I mean, you have the West Bank, which is the West Bank of the Jordan River, which includes half of Jerusalem, includes Bethlehem, Jericho. That's a predominantly Muslim. You have the Gaza Strip, which right now is pretty much empty because of the war, but that was predominantly Muslim. Definitely. And then Muslims live all throughout the land of Israel too. Mm -hmm. So. In fact, they live all around the Middle East, yeah. in North Africa. Well, yeah, North Africa, the Middle East, Turkey. Those are all Muslim. Afghanistan, countries. Pakistan, Iraq, Iran. Yeah, all, all. Muslim. That's including right. Including Dubai, Qatar. That's right. Saudi Arabia. Yep. United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Ethiopia, not Ethiopia, um, Sudan, Egypt, Libya. I mean, all those, they're, yeah, they're all majority Muslim countries. Right. And if you were to go to the countries that are majority Muslim and preach the gospel, they'd probably kill you. They'd probably kill you. But you come to a Christian nation and, and you have freedom. Well, this isn't a Christian nation, but you know what I mean. This is founded on Christian principles. And if, if they come here, and they want to share the truth, they're, they're allowed to do that. Right. As long as they're not going to be violent. Yeah, they, they just want to share the truth, they can do that. Who, the Christians or Muslims? Muslims, here in America, they can share the truth. Freedom of religion. That's right, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But if you go to a country that's, that's, that's ruled by Muslims, there's no freedom of religion there. No freedom of speech. You have to obey what they say or you're dead. Or you're in jail, you're arrested. So. I know all those Muslim countries are very strict with their religion. That's right. They have Sharia law. Yeah. Yeah, so severe repercussions, severe punishments for promoting Christianity in a Muslim country. There's lots of Christians in Iran, but they're what we call underground. They're kind of hidden, and they share the gospel, but not like I'm doing right now. They share it very secretly. Because they don't want to get persecuted. Yeah, they want to be able to continue to share the truth as many as possible. So, so what are you studying here, man? I'm studying computer science. Okay. Yeah. Great. What year are you? One. Oh, yeah. you're a freshman. Year. Freshman. Okay, great. Well, you'll be seeing me more. I'll, I, I come like three or four times a semester usually. Three or four times a semester. I come here, yeah. That's right. That's not a lot of times. I mean, it's compared to some people, it's a lot. I mean, I go to other campuses, too. Of this same school? Yeah, well, I go to, like, Georgia State University, mm -hmm. Kennesaw State, uh, Georgia Tech, UGA, Valdosta State, Auburn. You know, that, those are the ones I go to mostly in this area. Hey, I have a question. How sure. long are y'all going to be here today? Because I, I have something I got to do first, and yeah. I just wanted to see if y'all were interested in any debate at all. Yeah, I mean, we'll probably be here, like, three. Three? Okay. Yeah. Are y'all interested in debate at all? Yeah, I'll talk to you. Yeah, of okay. course. Yeah. All right. Well, it was nice talking to you. What's your name, man? Daniel. Daniel. Good name. I like the name. Kerrigan. Good to meet you, Daniel. Your name is what? Kerrigan. Kerrigan. Yes, sir. Nice good to meet you, Daniel. All right. God bless you, man. God bless you. Have a good day. You too. How's it going, man? I like that. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate it.
Are you a follower of Christ yourself? Yeah, of course. Okay. How long have you been born again for? Huh? When did you get when did you become born again? When I was twelve, so maybe like eighteen, like six years ago. Okay. So you're following Christ? Yeah. Banging and keeping his commandments? Yeah. It's hard to stay holy in this environment, man. It is. Once you like get into it, you know the devil is gonna try try to attack you more and more. So it's more hard for right. you to like, you know, stay focused. But right. as long as you keep like doing things they gotta do, as long as you have God by your side, as long as you pray, you know. Stay in the word. Yeah, stay in the word. Pray. Yeah. Meditate upon the word of God. Yeah. Amen. You, you be good. Well, God bless you, man. And God bless you too. Y'all okay. have a good one. You too. Something for you to read? I'm good. What do you think about the sign? I mean, I'm all about Jesus. I'm a Christian. Okay. Uh, I just think this is the wrong way of going about it. What do you mean by that? It's just trying to use like. I feel like you're trying to use like judgment and shame to kind of coerce people into the religion, and I don't think that's what people are like. I don't like. I don't think people are going to be wanting to sign up for that. Well, I'm not trying to get people to sign up. I'm just trying to, to tell people the truth, um, which is what God tells us to do: to tell people the truth. Yeah, but this isn't like a good way of going about it. Telling people the truth is not a good way to go about telling people the truth. Well, I mean, I think so. One of the things that's good about Christianity is, you know, the eternal love. That God has, um, and I think kind of starting with that is better than trying to scare people. You know, like you, you want people to come to Christ with a sense of love, not a sense of like fear and oh, yeah. and like hatred and shame. And, you know, uh, well, the fear of God's the beginning of wisdom. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. You should. I mean, so it's the beginning of wisdom. God is way more powerful than any of us, and He He, he knows. It's just that like. I think uh, it, it's better to open up with the, the good things about it to kind of get people to be like, oh, okay, like, God loves me and accepts me, um, rather than just being like, oh, like, God doesn't like you because of all these things and you're going to go to hell. Like, I mean, that's part of it, but I just think okay, if, well, if you're wanting people to, like, listen to the word of Jesus, I just feel like this is, like, a particularly hateful way of doing it. Well, there's nothing hateful about telling people the truth, even the hard truths about hell and sin and judgment and, and repentance. Those are all loving things, the things Jesus Christ taught about all the time. In fact, I, I can't remember one time Jesus talked about the love of God for all of humankind to a bunch of people. He talked about it one time to one person that we have recorded, John 3, 16. Yeah. But you want me to do that all the time. I, I mean, I don't... Funny. I'm just saying he didn't do it at it's all. It's just my, my personal opinion. I just. Well, I'm saying if, if we're gonna if we're gonna be followers of Christ, we need to do what he did and said what he said. Yeah. And what you're what you're trying to say is someone should do as a Christian, is not what Jesus Christ did. Yeah. So you, so you, that means you would be in error. You're, you're not you're not actually following Christ by doing it the way you think you should do it. Well, you I mean, you would have criticized Jesus Christ the same way. Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm a, a sinner myself. You know, I I fall astray. Um, but I always, you know, do my best to kind of snap myself out of it and go back to Jesus um, rather than kind of dwelling on the, the shame of all the ways that, like, like I'm terrible because that just kind of kind of reinforces it. And I don't know, it's just somebody, like, I, I've struggled with, like, suicidal thoughts, and I, I found that because I've been a Christian my whole life that I got more suicidal when I kind of started thinking more about that shame and uh, kind of feeling like there's no way I could ever change. But with... You know, with Christ, I feel like you always kind of have that forgiveness. You should always do your best to repent and try to stay on the path. But I think it's just in the blood that everyone kind of strays away. That's not true. No, no one is. No one has sin in their blood. No one sins a choice you make, and so you can choose to stop sinning. You can choose to be do what is right and be righteous, like God calls you to, and that is the way out. I mean, God provides a way out every time you're tempted to sin. God provides a way out, and. And Jesus Christ, the change he offers is a, is a miraculous change. Mm -hmm. It's not something that happens like little by little over time. It's miraculous. It's instantaneous. You don't think it could happen little by little? Um, no, because the rep repentance means that you're turning from all known sin. So it's not just like, okay, I'll, I'll, like for example, if someone was sinning, lying seven times a week, every day, one lie a day. They say, well, I'm going to repent. And they start lying six times a week. And then it's five times a week. That's not repentance. Repentance is stopping it completely. Like, you don't lie at all anymore. You stop lying, period. And now, if, if they were to lie, 
there's still forgiveness available to them. But repentance is not, okay, I'm going to try to stop and I'll just cut back a little bit. Okay. So if I were to compare it to cigarette smoke, it wouldn't be like, okay, I'm putting a nicotine patch on and eventually I'm going to, um, I'll, maybe I'll vape a little bit instead and then eventually I'll stop doing it altogether. It's like it's cold turkey. That's what repentance means. Okay. And so I, I can understand if, if you're still in sin yourself, why you wouldn't tell people these things because you're guilty of it yourself. You'd, you'd be a hypocrite to tell someone that they're going to hell yeah, for these yeah, things. Yeah. But, it, but if, if you're actually been saved from these things, and that is, that is actual salvation, according to Jesus Christ, being delivered from sin, practically speaking, not just the consequences of it, not just shame and guilt, but actual the sin, where the shame and guilt comes from, then you would, you'd want to tell the people about it. And that's why I tell the people about it, because I've been delivered from sin, yeah, but saved from my sin. It just kind of seems like it's, um, it, it does kind of like, I'm not saying that you are this way, but it, like to somebody who might f fall under one of these uh, categories, it just kind of seems like an attack, but like not really like giving them the reasons. Like, so like for homosexuals. Well, no, you got the other side too. You don't forget the other side of the sign. It's a whole other side of the sign. Yeah, I mean, I, I rock with this side. This is a good side. But they're both good. Yeah. You, you can't you can't separate one from the other. This is two sides of the same coin. This is the message Jesus Christ preached was the whole counsel of God. Yeah. And if, if, I, if, I, if he focused on anything, it would be this side. This is what he focused on. <laughs> you, you get a red-letter edition of the Bible with Jesus' words in red, he talks about this way more than this. Way more. So, I mean, I'm just being like Jesus Christ by doing that. And if someone feels bad when they feel, see the side of the sign, that's actually a good sign because feeling bad is a work of the conscience that God has given you. And it's a sign you're being convicted about your sin. And it's it's... It's an internal thing that God put within you to cause you to go the other way. But people who aren't familiar with the scriptures don't know that. And that's doesn't, doesn't matter if they're familiar or not. This is the truth. So, mm -hmm. so people, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can they believe the one that heard? How can they hear without a preacher? But Romans 10 says. And so, yeah, that passage is talking about those who have never heard. Right? And so how do they hear? A preacher comes. And tells them the truth. And so truth comes, they have, to have a decision to make. Am I going to continue to walk in sin? Or am I going to forsake that sin, trust in Jesus Christ, and be delivered from that sin and walk in holiness? That's a choice we all have to make. But I'll tell you this, that in the midst of sin, and the sorrow that comes with it, and the conviction that comes with it, the next message the devil gives you is what? Kill yourself. If you die in sin, you go to hell. Yeah. So of course that's from the devil. I understand why you've had those, those temptations, and I've talked to other people who've had the same temptations. I've, even back before I was a believer in Christ, I had the same kind of temptations. The devil's main goal against any human being who's made in God's image is to get them to sin, number one, first of all, to get them to stay in that sin, then to die in that sin. So what's the quickest route to that? Kill yourself. But uh, I, I've always just been kind of under the impression that you know, as long as you're in flesh, you're in sin. No. Like the the, uh, the reason true. why like, Jesus was able to be without sin is because he was the Son of God. He was no. supposed to lead as an example, even though it's. No. Well, he he didn't he didn't have like an upper hand. Okay, he, it's, the Bible says that he was tempted in all points, like we are, yet without sin. So if he had the upper hand, like, it's like saying like, let's say you were going to go arm wrestle somebody, and they outweighed you by two hundred pounds, and they had really big biceps and really big forearm. And they knew the technique that they've been wrestling, arm wrestling for a decade. They had the upper hand on you. I mean, it's not fair that they can beat you in arm wrestling. But that's not what Jesus Christ was like. He was tempted in all points, like we are, yet without sin. He could have given in to sin, but he chose not to. And that's why he's a perfect example for us of how we should live our lives. And the same power he had available to him to not sin, the same power we have available to us, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's God, right? Kind of sort of, yeah. No, he is. I mean, he's the third person of the, God, of the Trinity. Yeah, the Trinity. Yeah. Okay, so he's, he's God, and he lives inside of Christians. So the same power Jesus had, the same power we have. We have power to overcome sin. And so, of course, the devil, if, he, if his goal is to get you to sin and stay in sin and die in sin, the first thing he will do to professing Christians, he will give them a doctrine that justifies their sin, that makes them feel comfortable in their sin, and keeps them in it. And so one of those doctors is, oh, you, you have a, a flesh, therefore you're going to be a sinner until the day you die. That's not true. The Bible nowhere teaches that. In fact, Jesus Christ in John 5, 14, and in John 8, 11, 
he command us to go and sin no more. I, you know, I just feel like the faith has been done. Uh, and, uh, like, with this, like, say if a homosexual walked by, right. and they're like, I'm homosexual, right. this guy is trying to shame me for being that. Like, th this homosexual has never been introduced to the Word of God. So the only thing he knows about God is uh, that he's rejected by him. And so that's not okay, a, that's a, fine. a really good starting that's fine. point. That's fine. I mean, that, that's the truth. That's a, that's a good starting point, the truth. I mean, it's not the whole truth, but it's but part of the truth. If you, like, want to save people from going to hell, uh, Well, that's, that's, that's that, my primary goal in everything I do to, to administering the gospel is to declare the whole truth to as many people as possible. I can't control it if they only get part of it. I have the whole truth on my sign. I have the whole truth in my, on my... Is this the whole truth? Yeah, of course, of course. Both sides are the whole truth. My sign has the whole truth on it. Of course it does. I don't feel like you could fill the whole whole truth onto a sign. No, I don't mean like all the truth in the world is on my sign. I mean the good news and the bad news are on my sign. There's enough truth on this sign to get you saved. Yeah. It, and like, I don't know, I guess what I'm kind of getting at with uh, like homosexuals is that they, they often talk about how they wish that they weren't that way, but they just are. No, I don't that's believe not, that. And that's not like a choice in their See, See, it comes to the point where people say stuff like that. You have to say, well, am I going to believe God or am I going to believe them? Because God's word says they're not made that way. They're not born that way. No one made them that way. God made them in their mother's womb. God didn't make them a homosexual. But say that, like, you know, some, some people turned homosexual after, like, sexual trauma. Yep. Uh, that you was, see when it happens. There was, uh, that happened when they were young. Yep. Um, that wasn't God's will. Yeah, that wasn't. No. Nope. Um, but it's, it's buried beneath all those layers, and they might not even be aware of that trauma. Well, I don't know if they're not aware of the trauma. Maybe they're not connecting the dots that they should. Because most homosexuals I talk to, I've talked to thousands. They all say, I was born this way, I can't help it. Very few say, I'm this way by choice. Yeah. Okay, so, and it's the same thing with professing Christians who want to say, well, I can't help but the sin. I'm going to tell them that's not true. And that might bring them guilt and shame because now they know, well, I'm fully responsible. i got to stop this. Right? There may bring some shame and guilt to that. But shame and guilt is a good function of your conscience that God has given you. Yeah. And it's to get you to turn away from it. I mean, if something makes you feel shameful and guilty, it should make you want to stop it, right? Yeah. Uh, That's the way I am. I mean, if I feel guilty, I don't want to keep doing it. Yeah, but then there's like a willpower issue. Like, you know, there, there's, there's drug addicts who want to stop doing drugs, but they can't because uh, they don't have the willpower to anymore. Well, no, I, I wouldn't even agree with that. Like, I have a sister who was a drug addict. Died at 37 years old. She went to rehabs and got help and came out of it and she went back to it that's her choice man i mean you can't blame it on the flesh you can't blame it on willpower and when it comes down to it i'll tell you this when it comes to sin overcoming it for a long period of time you need the holy spirit no doubt about it that's why christ tells them to come to him that's why he offers them the new birth transformation on the inside i mean i, I was a sinner man i was a wicked sinner i never did drugs i wasn't a homosexual but i was a wicked sinner yeah and, and the only thing that saved me from that, a life of sin, is Jesus Christ, which is what I'm telling people. He can save a homosexual. He can save a drug addict. He's done it many times before and will continue to do that. I mean, the Apostle Paul killed Christians. That was what he was going around doing from place to place. He was killing Christians. And God saved him, a murderer of other Christians. So yeah, God can save anybody. That's why he called himself the chief of sinners for the things that he did before he became a follower of Christ. Okay. So, I mean, God can save them, of course, but to not tell them the hard truth because the way it'll make them feel inside is not, it's not the right thing for me to do as a Christian. Well, I, and it's not that they shouldn't know about that. It's just, I'm not sure if it's effective to open up with that. No, I, I wouldn't agree with that either. I mean, you look, go, go Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. You probably have a Bible at home, I'm sure. If you don't, you have it on your phone, very easy access. Yeah. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Go through that and tell me how many times Jesus Christ talked about God's love and how many times talked about sin repentance and hell over and over again this is the, the the best preacher ever the son of God in flesh preaching the word of God giving us an example on what we should be preaching on by his example surely he didn't do things wrong surely he knew how to do things and so if someone is in sin I'm gonna tell them the truth the whole truth not but the truth now I'll tell you this though if someone's really humble like broken over their sin I'm going to tell them about the good news more than anything else. If someone's prideful and boasting about their sin, I'm going to tell them the bad news more than they, that's what they need. Yeah. 
right? It's like if you, if you have a cancer patient, you're not going to give them a, a penicillin shot, right? Uh, if someone has some kind of disease, you're giving the right medicine for that disease. And so if someone's humble, the Bible says God gives grace to the humble, and he opposes the proud. And so I want to do the same thing as a servant of God. I want to give them grace if they're humble. That's what God wants us to give to them. But if they're prideful and, and they're pleased with their sin, they want to continue on and give them the judgment of God because they need to hear that. They need to hear the warning. Like if someone is like driving 60 miles per hour towards a cliff, right? The bridge is out. Stop, stop. The bridge is out. You're going to die. Right? That's what I'm going to say to them. Yeah. But if someone's slowly driving like five miles per hour and they see the sign, they're like, ooh, that sign right there is telling me the bridge is out. Uh, then I'm going to say, yeah, you saw the sign, didn't you? Yeah, you should probably go ahead and turn around. I guess, yeah. yeah. I mean, egos are kind of trickier than that, especially with someone who's prideful because, uh, you know, it could be like an attack on their ego and then it puts them in the defensive position rather than the receptive position. That's, that's psychology nonsense, man. I mean, I'm giving you the Bible. Okay, God is the creator of every human being and he says he opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, but I mean, to kind of understand like human nature, you would want to have like... Do you think God understands human nature better than you? Yeah. That he's a creator? Okay, so if, if he tells you yeah, he opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Don't you think you should follow in his footsteps? Well, I mean, okay, say that, like, you know, your, your soul, your spirit, you're inhabiting the flesh. Uh, the flesh can be a tool for, uh, you know, walking with God or not. Walking That's with right. God. And you want to be able to know your tool, kind of like how, you know, you wouldn't want to use a hammer to break a bone in half because uh, it would just be better to, like, use a saw or like use a hammer or something else you want to know your tool and you you have things in your psychology in your body that affect how you act and so having knowledge of how that stuff works i think would be helpful like especially in terms of do you think god has knowledge of how this stuff works yeah okay so he has the greatest knowledge of any of us yeah. of how because he's the maker of us it, yeah. it's like going to someone who created the windows program but he would know every everything about it so, so for you to try to walk in that, the psychology wisdom, if you want to call it that, that you've been learning about how to interact with someone, God says something directly different than that. And Jesus didn't do that himself. Like when Jesus dealt with the Pharisees, for example, they were prideful hypocrites. Yeah. If you can give two words to describe the Pharisees, be prideful and hypocrites. He, he didn't deal with them like soothing their, their ego. He gave them the hard truth and they wanted to kill him. And guess what they ended up doing? killing him. Yeah. You might say, well, psychologically, yes, you could have been a little nicer to them. Maybe they wouldn't have killed you. Right? But that's not what he did. And so I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to follow in his example above Sigmund Freud, who was a pervert. Oh, yeah, he was. I mean, yeah. why would I ever believe anything he says is, whiz, is wise? He's a, he's a pervert, man. I mean, he's, he's not a good source of wisdom and information, even if some things he said were true. But when, if he says something that he th says is true and it's directly against the Word of God, I'm taking the Word of God every time. Yeah, I mean, the Word of God is supreme. The Bible's, God, uh, the Bible's God's Word, so. But I mean, you, you can't deny that he did have fragments of truth, and should you de denounce and devalue what everything uh, what someone has to say? Just no, 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 I'm not saying that. I mean, there's people who are Muslims who are really good at math. Yeah. They're wrong in their religion. They're wrong about Jesus Christ. I can learn math from them. I'm not going to learn about pride and humility and how to deal with a human being. And that's another thing. Like, from for Sigmund Muslims, Freud. Like, people just kind of grow up that way. That's, uh, like, the only thing that they know. Yeah. Um, like, how are they supposed to know any better? Well, okay, so everyone, no matter who you're born to, where you're born, what time you're born, you all have a conscience given to you by God that tells you right from wrong. It accuses you when you do wrong. excuses you when you do right. That's what the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 2. And they all have the light of creation. So they, from those two things, they can discern that there is a God. And to some degree, what he's like. Yeah. Doesn't tell you everything. Just basic, bare-bones stuff about morality and what God expects out of you. Now, if someone is obeying those two lights that they have, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, whatever, and they're seeking the truth, they're seeking to know more of the truth, well, God will reveal himself to them. Well, I mean, just like, so you, you grow up as a Muslim, you're a child, you're just kind of... Naive, so to say. We're not talking about children, though. Children are not, children are not sinners. Well, yeah, but like, if you're a child and you grow up as a Muslim, yeah, um, how are you supposed to like know, like objectively, that Christianity is? You seek truth. That's what I'm saying. You seek the truth. If someone's but seeking the truth, they're going to find it. That that's their truth, even if that truth is. Do you do you do everything you were raised? 
Huh? Do you do everything your parents raised you to do? No, but what, what okay. I'm saying that's is my that point. Like, so when you grow, when you grow up, you get older, you have an opportunity to seek the truth. But if you kind of grew up with all that, and that has kind of served as your how you're grown up does not matter. You don't you don't do the way you're grown up. I don't live the way I was grown up. I wasn't raised a Christian. I don't live that way anymore. There's Muslims who become Christians all the time. Yeah, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just okay, saying that's my that point. Way. So, so the the issue is not a matter of access to knowledge or ignorance. The issue is, do they really want the truth? And if they really want the truth, they'll seek after it and they'll find it. But how can they distinguish that? How can they distinguish that, like Christianity? Or how did you distinguish between truth and false? I mean, I grew up with Christianity, so. But I'm talking about other things. But if, if I didn't grow up with Christianity, I, I often wonder, would I still be a Christian today if I didn't? Grow up? Well, I mean, growing up in Christianity does not make you a Christian. Well, yeah. You well, have I'm to decide at your own... You're, you're your own biased to those kind of well, ideas. I mean, you were raised I don't think anyone's biased to that. I mean, they, they, they were raised a certain way. Their parents have accountability for how they raised them, and they have accountability for what they do with their lives. God has given them that, uh, that free will to decide. Even if you are raised a Muslim, there's people who I know who are raised Muslims who don't choose not to be a Muslim. Yeah. It's just that, like, when yeah. you're a child and you're, you're, like, learning these things and sure. the foundations of who you are. Yeah. And, uh... People you, escape those foundations all the time, though. All yeah. the time. I, I talk to students, hundreds of students every week, who don't believe what their parents told them to believe. I'm just saying, like, so, can they really be held accountable if they were raised Muslim? That's all they know. They walk by, they see your sign, they're like... Of course they're held okay. accountable. Um, they're held accountable for the truth they know, the knowledge they have, and for whether they're seeking after the truth or not themselves. Yes, God definitely holds them accountable. And, and, and no one has any excuse. I mean, really, what, what it seems like you're saying is that they're going to have some kind of excuse on Judgment Day when the Bible says the exact opposite. But they have no excuse. Well, it's, it's not that they don't have an excuse. It's just that they, they don't know any better. It's like, well, this is my faith. It's helped me out my, my whole life. Why should I abandon it for this one I don't really know that much about? Just because somebody says it's wrong. Well, I don't know if it's helped them their whole life or not. I, I can't answer that question. But, I mean, I've talked to lots of Muslims over the last 26 and a half years I've been a Christian. And I don't really know any that that would say something like that. It's helped me my whole life. I'm like, so if you as a Christian were walking down here and you saw like signs like this, but they were for Muslims. Yep. Um, how do you think you would react to that? You would say, like, this I would engage them in conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's what I would do. But like, how can you distinguish your truth from their truth? Well, it's very simple. I mean, you, you look at what they say is true from the Quran, and you analyze it within itself. You do an internal critique of that religion, and you find that it's wanting. You do the same thing with Christianity, it's not wanting. It's completely coherent and logical and true. It's not hard to do. I mean, I've, I've done it with most major religions. I've looked at their, what they say and how it internally has issues. It's not even imp imposing my Christianity upon it now. Just internally looking at it, it has all kinds of problems. I'll give you one example from Islam. Islam says that Allah has no son. Right? It denies the Trinity. It says Jesus Christ did not die on the cross, that actually Judas died on the cross, but just looked like Jesus died on the cross. And it says Jesus Christ is just a prophet. Right? It says all those things. But then it says, go to the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, to understand what the truth is. It'll tell you to read the Injil, which is the Gospel. It'll tell you to read the Psalms, the, the writings of David, and read the writings of Moses. And all those things contradict what the, what the Quran says. So now you have a problem within the Quran itself where it teaches these things. It teaches, go to these people who will teach you the exact opposite of these things. So it's a very confusing religion. So you do an internal critique, you can see for yourself. But, but one of the reasons why preach, God sends preachers out, according to Romans 10, is to declare the truth to people who don't have it. And that's not the only means God has to share the truth with people. I mean, God can do it himself, too. He can use dreams, visions, angels, yeah. right? So he's not, God's not constrained to missionaries or preachers, men. He can do the work on his own. It's just the primary means he uses. So the whole purpose of preaching is to reveal truth to people who don't have it. Yeah, it's just like, you know, how, how can you know that is the truth right from the get-go? Because, you know, Christianity is a really dense thing. It has over 2,000 two years of work behind it. It's a dense book. It can be it can hard to get into. So, uh, and you could just kind of hear from passing like what people are saying. You could be like, sure. oh, this is contradictory, this is it, and they just don't know any better. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that people hear it the first time and automatically believe it, true. I mean, a, a friend of mine named Mark Cahill, he has a book on this called One Heartbeat Away, and also One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven, books about evangelism. 
he actually lives in the Atlanta area, and he talks about how, according to stats, people who are saved now heard the gospel over seven times before they got saved. Yeah. That's true about me. Like, I, I heard the truth many times before I got, became a Christian. It's not a matter of just hearing it once and getting saved, but it's a matter of sowing the seed of the gospel. I'm sowing the seed. I'm hoping it finds fertile ground in people's hearts, and they believe, but I can't control that. But I might just be one step in the, in the way, on the way to them becoming Christian. And that's why, as a Christian, my, my goal is not um, results-oriented. My goal is biblically-oriented. And so I'm just being a faithful witness of the gospel to share as many, with as many people as possible as, as, as I can. Yeah. And I, and, I, and, I can't, and I can't control when they walk by if they only hear parts of it. Yeah. Same thing with Jesus. When he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, people were probably walking by only hearing parts of it too. Yeah, but one of the things about Christianity, though, is that there's like so many denominations. I feel like there's so much to it. It can be so complicated. And like people yeah. have all different ideas. Like how, like how you were uh, kind of got into the religion is way different than I. Like I was kind of told that, like, you know, uh, judgment's not for you, it's for the poor. And you should love your neighbor. And so, like, first and foremost, I'm, I'm loving everyone, even if they're sinners, because uh, they're on their own journey. And, uh, you know, I've sinned. I, I, I can't, like, cast out onto them. I, I can kind of ask them to follow Jesus as an example, but I can't condemn their character. I, I don't have that within my power. Okay, so when it comes to Christianity, it doesn't matter what your denomination is. I'm not here promoting a denomination. But the, the tr what the matters is, is whether what you believe aligns with the scriptures, the Bible. If it does not, throw it away. Hold to the scriptures, okay? When I became a Christian, I was a part of the Church of Nazarene. And after a few years of reading the Bible for myself, I was kind of at the mercy of the pastors at that point in time. I was completely new, blank slate. Didn't know anything about Christianity, really. I mean, I was kind of raised Roman Catholic-ish a little bit. We go to the they're on the holidays sometimes, but we were not devout, we were not faithful. I knew nothing about God. Well, okay. and that's why I think psychology but, does play a role into it, is because how you approach the book and the scriptures uh, serves how you interpret it. And interpreting it is a big part of it, because it does use a lot of, like there's a lot of parts of it that are ambiguous that could kind of change the whole context of the book if you interpret it one way or another. Yeah, I don't and think so, it's ambiguous at all, but I mean, there are, there are definitely metaphors and similes and hyperbole and that kind of yeah, literal and, parts as well. But, what, but go back to my story just for a second here. So I, w I was in the Church of Nazarene, after reading it for a few years, I began to understand things for myself. And so I had to reject certain things I was taught because they weren't true. And so yeah, you have to read the Bible for yourself. You have to understand it for yourself. You can't rely on a pastor. You cannot rely on a denomination or a statement of faith or a creed or a catechism. You have to read it for yourself. And when you do, the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. And at the same time, you're being teachable and you're being humble willing to adjust what you believe to what new truth you might understand later on. And but what I'm saying is like for the like for the interpretation of the book, like just by our lived experiences, we could have different interpretations. Like a purple door means something different to you than it means something to me. Okay, but that, that doesn't your, your interpretation, my interpretation means nothing really. What matters is what the truth is. Okay? So when it comes to how we interpret the word of God, we could both be wrong, or only one of us could be wrong. But if our interpretation disagree, we can't both be right. Yeah. That's the way the Bible works. And so, like, you gave an example earlier, like, you can't judge people. The Bible nowhere says that. Typically, Matthew 7, 1 is used to justify that, that belief. That's not what it teaches. Read Matthew 7, 1 through 5, you'll see what it's teaching. It's teaching against hypocritical judgment, not judgment altogether. And you have verses like John 7, 24, where it says, Jesus says, when you judge, judge with rights of judgment. So he's calling you to actually judge. And then 1 Corinthians 2, 15 says, a spiritual man judges all things, and he himself is rightly judged by no man. So we have these scriptures that obviously contradict the understanding of some people that we can't judge people. And that's what I mean. Like, it, it could just be confusing. No, it's not confusing. It's very simple to understand. It seems confusing. No, I mean, if you read it for yourself, it's pretty easy to understand. It's only confusing because you have you've believed a lie. You haven't believed the truth on this issue. That's why it's confusing for you. But if you open the Bible for yourself, and read it for yourself and see what it says without those I can't judge glasses on. You take those off and say, what does the Bible actually say? I'm not going to read no judgment allowed into this verse. I'm just going to read what it says and take it for what it says and believe it and obey it. You'll come to the same conclusion. I'm confident of that. So, I mean, it, there's no ambiguity in the scriptures. People can have misunderstandings, no doubt about it. They can have false doctrines. I, mean, I know some people right now who believe, falsely believe that if you don't get water baptized, you're going to hell. Yeah. 
and it, that's it, not true. It's stuff like that, and it's like, and then like, so th there's a translation like the, uh, I think it's the verse about homosexuals in particular, where some people argue it's a mistranslation. You should not lay with a boy rather than you should not lay with. That's actually not what it says. Arsenal Code Tice in First Corinthians six nine and ten, which is translated as sodomite in New King James Version, means man with man in bed. Yeah, that's but, literally what it means. It, it's, it's, it's talking about the homosexual act of sodomy. That's why they're called sodomites. Hold on a second. And then malakoi is the other Greek word there. And it's the, the, the uh, word for homosexual. That's a, someone who's not necessarily engaged in the act of it, but they're actually trying to actively be a homosexual. Okay, so those are the two words used there in the Greek. You can look at any Greek lexicon and see these things for yourself. A Greek, that's a Greek dictionary. This is not hard to understand. I mean, people, people believe these things because they want to. I've talked to lots of homosexuals about this, those two verses, and, and what those words mean. And they've been lied to uh, by people who are ministers who are homosexuals. No wonder. And that's like another thing, it's like, who, like what authority figure are you gonna trust to tell you, oh, this translation means this? None, you look at the Bible for yourself. But. And, and, and in the book of Acts, the apostle Paul went to a place called Berea. In Berea, the people there were more noble-minded, he said. They checked everything he said against the scriptures, and he called them noble-minded for doing that. He didn't chastise them for that. He didn't put them down for that. He didn't say, touch not the anointed. He actually praised them for checking what he said for themselves. And so that's why we, you probably heard this saying for you need to be a, a Berean. A Berean is someone who reads the word for themselves, understands it for themselves, and they can check what they're hearing against the ultimate and absolute standard of God's word. That's what God wants you to do. Don't just believe what you've heard, whether you heard it from your parents, your pastor, whoever. Check the Bible for yourself. Yeah. Be a Berean. But, uh, yeah, and I, I agree. Like, you should, if you really want to get to like, the nitty gritty of it, read the Bible yourself. Um, and that's what I do. Like, I, I don't like going to church because I feel like I have to deal with all these different kind of interpretations and all these different kind of like. <laughs> Like, I feel like people come to different conclusions than I do from reading the Bible just because of their subjectivity. Um, okay. And that's what I mean is, like, it, it can be difficult because if you just sit down and read the Bible, like, even if it seems, like, pretty straightforward, people come away with it with different conclusions. Why do you think that is? I, I think it's because of their, their personal experience, their personal history, and their, their subjectivity because as they kind of grow up, they're, they're primed to lean in certain philosophical directions than others and that's just because they're familiar with it and so like it's easier for me to get in the western philosophy mindset because i grew up that way whereas i can kind of get a good idea of the eastern philosophy mindset but i i don't get it because like i don't know the nuances of it i just have a surface knowledge it's not really a matter of philosophy per se when it comes to understanding the bible that's an example i, I think i think firstly since the ultimate source of the Bible is the Holy Spirit who wrote it down through holy men, most people don't have the Holy Spirit. They're trying to understand as someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, who's the author, the ultimate author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. So like when I was in college, we had poetry class. Uh, we had 35 students in the class. The teacher would say, here, read this poem. Come back tomorrow and tell me what it means. Came back with 35 different interpretations usually, or close to that. Maybe some that are similar. But if, if she invited the actual poet to the class, you would know exactly what he meant, okay? So before I became a Christian, I tried to read the Bible. I tried to understand it, couldn't understand it. I'd read and read, couldn't understand it. When I became a Christian, it's like scales fell from my eyes. I began to understand in ways I had never before, never even come close to before, because now I had the author of that book living inside of me. And so most people are, are unbelievers or they may say they're actually a Christian but they really aren't because they've never been born again and they aren't living a holy life an obedient life to God therefore they're not going to understand these things can you blame them for that though? can't blame them for what? not like having a holy spirit no I can't blame them I can't blame them in the sense that, that they don't know there's an ignorance there but that's why I come and preach that they would know so they can have that opportunity to repent and get right with God and have the Holy Spirit and then therefore understand the scriptures so how do you get the Holy Spirit? repentance and faith but how do you get to that point of repentance without the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit convicts before you repent, but he won't come and live inside of you until you repent and believe the gospel. And he will only continue to live inside of you if you live a holy life. If you're constantly sinning, I mean, the Holy Spirit's not going to live in a defiled temple. He only lives in a clean temple. 
It's the presence of God living inside of you. So, yeah, but they need to hear the truth. And so I, I don't blame them for not having the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't blame them for being ignorant either. That's why I come and tell them the truth. But I do blame them for being a sinner. That's their choice. They've chosen to be a sinner every time they've sinned, and their conscience tells them not to be a sinner. So they, they, every time they've sinned, they could have chosen not to sin. And so, and I also blame them for not being a seeker of the truth. If they're not, if they're not seeking the truth, that's their, their worthy blame for that is too, because they need to be seeking the truth if they really care about the truth and really want to do what is right. Yeah, and, and you should care about the truth. I'm just saying, like yeah. for some of people who fall into these categories, they don't know what they're doing is sin, and it's... Um, I would agree with that. That's how the conscience tells them. Conscience accuse them when they sin. Well, yeah, well, like, you know, for the homosexual example, like, they know. It, it wasn't their choice, so they don't really view it as a sin, it's just who they are. Well, no, it was their choice to be a homosexual. If you go back to the example you gave earlier where the, maybe they were molested in some way, that tra trauma they experienced, and that maybe that, that, that tempted them to go further with it. But they Even, don't know that's a sin. Oh, no, they know it's a sin. Yeah, everyone knows homosexuality is a sin. I disagree with that. Well, you can disagree with that. That's what the Bible teaches. So you're disagreeing with the Bible. You're disagreeing with God's Word. And so you're exalting your wisdom upon God's wisdom. No. Yeah, that's what you're doing. God's wisdom says it's a sin, and people know that. It actually said it's, it's, it's actually against nature. So, so it's actually against nature to be a homosexual, I'm, not natural. What I'm saying is just like, how, you know, how is this going to like let people know if they don't have that knowledge? They're just like, oh, this person's telling me I'm a sinner. Like, the hell is that? Well, they have this. They have they have the knowledge already internally. Not everything on here is something that people don't know, but it's reaffirming what their conscience already tries to communicate with them. So, like an alarm clock has a snooze bar. And eventually, it'll probably stop coming on. Most long have like three snoozes. You can snooze it three times, and it's going to stop coming on. Um, same thing with your conscience. And so people can, they can hear their conscience, don't, don't do that, don't do that, and they do it, don't do that, and they do it. And after a while, it's like, not, not going to hear it at all, or they're going to ignore it so well, it's like it's not even there anymore. Okay. Yeah, so that's the way the conscience works according to the Scripture. You can defile your conscience, you can corrupt your conscience, you can sear your conscience according to the Scripture. So we don't want to do that. We want to take heed. I mean, as soon as we feel conviction about something and doing, if we're doing wrong, you know, just run from it. You know, repent of it. Do what is right instead. Okay. That's what God wants for us to do. All right. Well, I got to get going. It's okay. Good talking with you. You said, man, what's your name? My name's Christian. Oh, Christian. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good name. Can you give you something to read, man? Huh? Can I give you something to read? Sure. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take it. Right, man. Good talking but, to you, man. Yeah, it was good talking to you. I mean, I, I enjoyed hearing your opinions. Yeah. I just, uh, you know, I kind of have some reservations, but it, it was good hearing your, your point of view. Okay. Well, God bless you, man. Have a good day. Take care. Hey, man. Hey. I've talked to you before. Yeah. What's yeah. going on? Not much. I just, like, I just had some questions from last time. Okay, good. Like, on stuff, like, from, like, sanctification to, like, okay. salvation. Like, right. I, I just want to know, like, what you think. Okay. Like, do you believe in a workspace salvation, or do you no. believe, Okay, so you believe... Absolutely not. Day? Well, I mean, it's got to be a repentant faith. It can't be a faith that lacks works. Well, yeah, because faith, faith that works is dead. dead. That's right. So, I mean, like, for example, the, the thief on the cross had faith. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a chance to work out any works. And Jesus said, today would be with me in paradise. Yeah. So there's no doubt he was saved. Faith and no works. I mean, actually, maybe there was one work he did. The thief next to him was mocking Jesus, and he said, yeah, why? He, so he called him, he rebuked him for it. Yeah, that's, that's a good work, mm -hmm. so, yeah. right? But he wasn't even he was baptized. Yeah, so. He died on that cross. They broke his legs and he died. Yeah. Right? All right, and so I have, a, like, something else you said last time um, about, I can't remember, like, exactly that word. Like, it's sure. just something, like, I kept thinking about. Yeah. It's something along the lines of, like, once you were saved, like, you're no longer a sinner, or, like, you don't sin anymore. I think that's something, like, I don't, know, I don't want to put words in your I mean, that's, that's, that, that wouldn't be exactly what I would say, okay. but I, I would say this, that to become a Christian to begin with, you have to forsake all sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, all, You can't just like forsake it in chunks. Yeah, you can't just be like, oh, I'm just going to give up this now, but keep this. That's keep right. It. You got to get everything you know of. Like you can't get rid of something you don't know of, Yeah. but everything you know of, you should be getting rid of. Like it's almost like your health, like your physical health. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to improve your physical health, you might learn more things and get rid of more things. Like I, I recently in this last year, I've learned that seed oils are really bad for you. So I've been trying to take everything out of my diet that has seed oils in, like canola oil, um, what's the other oil? Sunflower oil, 
I can't remember off the top of my head, but all the seed oil I'm trying to get out of my diet. Yeah. Now, I didn't know that before now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can't do anything about it. But once yeah. you have knowledge of it, God calls you to get rid of it. And that's, like, that's kind of like the whole... Um... Sanctification yeah, yeah, sanctification process is not... I used to lie seven times a week. Now I'm lying six times a week, eventually I'll lie five times a week, and eventually I might give up and not lie anymore at all. No, sanctification, the process, quote unquote, of it is increasing in knowledge and therefore increasing in obedience. The more you know, the more you're required to obey. Yeah, discernment. Yeah, discernment's part of it too, for sure. That so just, that just comes with time, getting closer to God. You got to read the word, you got to pray, or you're not going to grow. Eventually, if you don't do that, you'll become lukewarm and depart from the faith. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that. But as far as growing, it requires you being active in reading the Word, praying, fasting, sharing the Gospel, being in fellowship, a good godly church, teaching the Word of God. All those things are so important. Worshiping God in song, these are all important for your growth as a follower of Christ. And if you do those things, things are going to come up that God's going to say, okay, no more of that. Or, let's do this instead. Right? I mean, there's something that came off right away from me. like like. When I became a Christian, I had probably, back in the day, we didn't have iPhones and smartphones. I had CDs, like 200 CDs. They were all ungodly, wicked CDs. And I tried to listen to one of them. After I got saved, I threw all of them in the trash. They all went to the dumpster, right? Other things happened over time. I mean, what's one example of that? Um, I think the way I drove was probably an example of that. You know, driving more respectfully mm -hmm. to the people around me. Yeah. That was one example of something that happened. So, and my standards as far as my interaction with women, like I stopped fornicating immediately. Mm -hmm. But my interaction with them, not being alone with them, not having them in my car, just me and them, those things changed over time. Yeah. Too. I began to understand boundaries were good. I don't want to give myself temptation I shouldn't have in my life to engage in activity I shouldn't be engaged in, you know? That was something. I also like sports. I used to be a sports fanatic, man, before I became a Christian. And I, I, I'm not saying anything wrong with sports, but there's lots of ungodliness in sports. Yeah. Football, basketball, hockey, baseball. I, used, I was a, used to watch all that stuff. I can't remember last time I watched a sports game, period. I, just, I don't spend my time on that stuff anymore. Yeah. Just not wasting my time. I have better things to do with my time. You know, so those are examples of stuff that happened over time with me, but the things I knew of immediately stopped. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And because like, I remember I that girl was talking to you, and like she had said something, kind of like along the lines of how we were like, we're still sinners, yeah. even though we're saved. Yeah. But like, through Jesus, we're redeemed. Yeah. Like, I think that's what she said. Yeah. And you seem to like disagree with that. I was just wondering like why. Yeah. So so yeah, we're we're called to be holy. We're called to be righteous. Nowhere in the Bible is a Christian called a sinner. They're called saints in the Bible. So I'm not talking about Roman Catholicism. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about actual saints. That ones you put on a necklace and pray to when they're dead. Um, but Paul was constantly writing to the saints at Thessalonica, the saints at Colossae. You look at the beginning of his epistles, always addressed to the saints. Saints is the Greek word hag hagiazo. It means a holy person. Someone who's separated from sin, separated to God for his purposes. This doesn't mean someone who's a saint doesn't have the ability to sin, doesn't have the free will to sin, or even the temptation to sin each and every day. But they're living a holy life. But with that, if I remember what that lady you're talking about said, she was saying that she, she can't stop sinning, she can't be holy, she's sinning every single day and thought we're indeed. That's not a testimony of a Christian. A Christian is someone who lives victoriously over sin. And if they sin, not like when, I'm going to sin every day, but if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, First John 2, 1. But he says, I write these things to you that you do not sin. That's the whole purpose. We, want, we don't want to be sinners. We want to be holy. But if we, find a, if we find sin in our lives, well, then deal with it. Repent of it. Get rid of it. Confess it to God. Forsake it to God. And just begin to walk in righteousness again. I mean, I'm not, I'm not I by any means saying that in the last 26 and a half years I haven't sinned. To my own shame, I've sinned too many times. But each time I, I went that way, if I didn't turn back to God, if I would have kept going that path, I would have departed from the faith and up in hell myself. Right? But by the mercy of God, I, I have cleansing from those sins as well. That makes sense. Um, 
But didn't Paul write at some point saying that we are all sinners and among them I am the greatest of them? No, so that's that's in First Timothy chapter one, I believe, I think verse fifteen, where he says I call him the chief of sinners. Um, and you look at the context, he's talking about his past things he did. Okay. He's mentioning what he did as, as he would go around murdering Christians and bringing them to jail, or approving of their murder anyway. I don't know if he ever physically murdered himself, but he approved of their murder, and approved of them going to jail. And he was there for Stephen, yeah. right? Holding the people's jackets, giving approval to what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what he's talking about. Okay. And he didn't continue to do that. Yeah. He repented of that, obviously. So he's not saying, I'm currently the chief of sinners. He's saying, I was the chief of sinners. Okay. And if you're looking at his life as a whole, even though God's forgiven all those things, he would be the chief of sinners in his eyes because he knows how wicked he was and the, the wicked things he did, you know? But most people would take what Paul said in Romans 7. Most people take what Paul said in Romans 7 and, and act like it's the normal Christian life. But it's really, Romans 7 is describing someone who's under conviction and about to become a Christian. And you look at Romans 6 and 8, it's obvious that a Christian is not called to be a sinner, called to be holy, to use their body, their instrument for righteousness, not for sin. And if you're under grace, according to Romans 6, 14, sin doesn't have dominion over you. So yeah, the grace of God, according to Titus 2, 11, another writing of Paul, the grace of God teaches me to live holy right now in this, this age, not wait till, I get to heaven, wait till I get to heaven to live holy, but live holy right now. And that's the power of God in my life the victory and transformation he gives us. All right. Well, thank you. That was all I had. This is just from last time. Yeah, man. Take care, man. You too. It was good to see you. Have a good day. You too. I have, I have one thing. Yeah, sure. Um, so a little bit ago, you said that, like, children, they're not they're not sinners. That's right. Like, I was just wondering, like, what did you mean by that? Like, what would you define as a child? Like, Okay. Well, in, in Christian doctrine, in Christian theology, we have something called the age of accountability. There isn't a certain age, per se, but there's like a state of accountability. So like some kids, and even people may never get out of the state. If they're mentally handicapped, they may never get out of the state of accountability, right? Where they come to the state of accountability. But I, got, I have eight children, okay? I've seen all of them grow up. They've all come to the state of accountability at different times, slightly different times. Um, but I would say all of them, at the, at the latest, came to it at 12, 13 years old. Some of them came to it much earlier. And so the state of accountability is when someone understands what God has required of them, and they choose to do otherwise. Then they become a sinner. So you're saying more so like they're not sinners until they get to the age of That's family. right. That's right. So God is like, I have children who obviously have done things that if I did it, it'd be sinful. Yeah. But God doesn't hold it against them because they don't understand. That's what you see in the scripture too. Like when Jesus talks about children, he says the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Unless you humble yourself and become like a little child, you by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. So well, some, certain Christian theology, so-called, like Calvinism, puts down children, the children of wrath, born sinners from the womb. I mean, that's pretty extreme and complete opposite of what Jesus said. And so, no, I don't think babies are sinners. They're not born sinners. They're born into a sinful world, sometimes with sinful parents and sinful, and, and sinful siblings. But they need to choose for themselves whether they're going to be a sinner or not. Sin is not something you inherit. It's like a, you can inherit like a, genital defect, you can inherit diseases, but you can't inherit sin. Because sin is not physical, sin is a moral choice you make to obey God or not. Yeah, so no, there can't be, a, it's not a physical, you can't put sin under a microscope and look at it, right? But you can take DNA and do that. And so sin doesn't pass through the semen, through the blood, sin is a choice you make, and you have to have a requires knowledge to make to become a sinner. Like James 4, 17 says, to him who knows to do good, and does not do it, to him it is sin. The knowledge required, you choose not to do it anyway, now you become a sinner. Oh. Yeah. That's all I have. Amen, amen, good question. Hey, you. Right, you too, man, have a good day. You too. You. What's going on, man? How you doing? I'm good, how about you? Great. I don't really have no questions, I just wanted to just see what, like, Everybody else was talking about. Yeah. Like so where are you at, man? Are you a follower of Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Yeah. I just feel like uh, it's still a lot of distractions on campus, though. Mm -hmm. And I feel like sometimes it's still a lot of like temptation. Like, it's a lot of temptations on campus. For sure. And sometimes it's hard to just. Well, I feel like my. I think my problem. I just need more 
people, like followers of, yep. of Jesus, like around me. That's right. Definitely part of it, man. I mean, you're in a situation where most college campuses are just full of sin. Uh, people around you, the things they want to do, the distractions, the activities, the way you use your time. And you need to be very diligent and vigilant yourself to get in the Word every single day, read it, study it, to get in private prayer every day with the Lord and speak to Him and have Him speak to you. If you're not willing to do those things, you're not going to make it. You're just not going to make it. I mean, it's like here at this, this school, if you want to get good grades on your tests, you've got to study. Right? If you don't want to, get, you want to fail your, your classes, you just barely scoot on by, you're not going to study. Right? But to make it in the end, you have to be in the Word. You have to be in prayer. And, uh, of course, fellowship with other believers is so essential. Like people who don't have, fel they're just ostracized, they're like separated from all believers and they're surrounded by unbelievers. Well, it's like darkness eating up the light. Your light's not going to last. Your candle's going to burn out. And you need to be in fellowship with other believers who love Jesus, who obey Jesus, and who will provoke you to obey Jesus and love Jesus, who will keep you accountable not to do what is wrong, right? All those things are important for every believer. Do you have those things? I, I have some resources. I yeah. just sometimes, like, they not really, like, on campus. Like, I have okay. to reach out. Like, me, I feel like my problem is, like, communication. Yeah. And sometimes I just don't just reach out to them. Are you from this area, like, originally? Mm -hmm. Where are you from? I'm from, like, South Fulton. South Fulton, okay. Okay, so you, when you were living at home before you came here, I'm assuming you live here now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm on campus now. Okay. Did you have a church you went to back there? Yes, sir. You just don't have one here? My grandfather, he was a pastor. Okay. But he just passed. So. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, it was like That's a good heritage, though, to have a grandfather who's a pastor. That's a good heritage to have. You know, God's given you a blessing in that. And I, I would just encourage you to, you know, take an extreme effort to, to not stop until you find a good church locally who will teach you the Word of God, disciple you, and also keep you accountable. It's so important, man. Otherwise, you're just going to fall away. You don't want that to happen, do you? You don't want to fall away and go to hell in the end, right? All right. So, I mean, it's important for you to get this right, man, that you can you can know what to do going forward, and you can stay in the faith, you know, and be holy. Amen? Yes, sir. Man. Okay. What's your name? Uh, Donovan Troy. Donovan Troy. Yes, sir. Can I pray for you, Donovan? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I just pray for Donovan right now, Father, that you would help him, Lord, that you, I'm glad he, Lord, he came by and stopped to me, and I pray, Father, you give him this, this zeal, this conviction, Lord, to do what it takes, Father, to find a biblical and godly church locally, and you would lead him, and you would guide him, Father, uh, to the right pastor, the right church, the right ministers, Lord, who care for his soul and want to disciple him in the truth, and Lord, he would just stay in the faith, Father, he would love you, he would obey you, and do whatever it takes each day, Lord, to resist temptation, to submit himself to you, and to walk in holiness and live and obey you, Lord. So in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. God bless you, man. Yes, sir. Good talking to you. Yes, sir. You too. Have a good day. Thank you.